The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who have dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they picked themselves up, and how they hope workplaces can change in the future. Today's show is about gaining clarity, even when you're anxious and times are tough. Whether you're facing a career change you didn't ask for and didn't want, or accepting that a goal you were so close to achieving, or a long-planned pivot is just not going to happen anytime soon, it can be difficult to show up and lead right now. Almost every professional in the world is feeling intense anxiety, fear, anger, helplessness. And then we have to lead the Zoom call or forecast the financial future anyway. Today's guest, Robert Glazer, says it's about gaining clarity. It's about asking yourself, what do I want to do and what can I do? Working to gain clarity on these questions, convening with close advisors or your leadership team, and then communicating outward. That is the secret to leading with a growth mindset in these really difficult times. Glazer will share what he's learning about how leaders are managing well during this crisis and what it takes to sit in uncomfortable feelings right now, accept reality, and still lead. Robert Glazer is a best-selling author and global speaker. He is the founder and CEO of the marketing agency Acceleration Partners and was ranked number two on Glassdoor's list of top CEO of small and medium companies in the U.S., We started by talking about the line between sharing vulnerability with colleagues and being a mess with a visceral analogy. There's a, there's a pilot's protocol called ANC, which is aviate, navigate, and communicate. And the premise is like when there's a problem with a plane, the first thing is you figure out like where you're going, fly the plane, then temp tell people what's going on, right? Because if you're communicating with them and crash the plane, it doesn't do a lot of good for people. So I I actually agree with that. And I think in some of this, people have had to aviate and navigate before they could communicate. Mm. But but then very quickly, I think you need to communicate, right? Have you ever been on an aborted landing and no one said anything for 45 seconds? Like it gets pretty awkward I, <laughs> you know, after <laughs> after a while. Oh <laughs> yes. uh, I've been in that position. I've been in, you know, I've been in that position and it was a German plane. And, you know, and then like a couple minutes later, the guy got, oh, well, sorry, we had to make a roundabout. And, mm-hmm. but we're, we, you know, I knew the plane was was intact. But so I, I have sort of a case study here. We chose very early on to to communicate openly and sort of rapidly like, hey, this is this is a big disruption. Here's what's going on. Here's where we're being aggressive. I mean, we, we kind of we shut down hiring and did some stuff like eat and, and canceled some events, even when it was still just hitting early because we just just had that spidey sense that it wasn't going to be good and it was going to be fast. And and actually, we had a bunch of people communicate to us in the couple of weeks, kind of, why are you traumatizing us with all this like information about what's going on and all the all, all the problems? And and people on your staff said that on our staff, yeah. And, and you know, we really wanted to be as open as possible. Like if we knew something and we understood it, we wanted to communicate it. That's always been our our thing. And then interestingly, like a couple of weeks later. A lot of them, a few came to their manager or, 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 or relayed feedback up saying, you know, what happened was, you know, they had a spouse or a partner who, who got no communication from the company mm. and they just assumed everything was great. And then they got laid off or blindsided and they kind of retroactively appreciated how upfront we had been in the communication, even though it was difficult for them to hear all of that stuff, because I think they preferred to know the sort of uh, the you know the the unsavory details at, at some point versus not know and, and and be blindsided and well and that that's what they they had sort of a case study in seeing that weeks later. So so what I think I hear you saying is that it's different for every leader in every company, but there's a middle ground 
to be found, it seems. Yeah, my, my general premise is, and, and, and ours as a leadership team is, I communicate something once I'm clear about it. Mm. If it's not something that people want to hear or it's bad or it's whatever and I know it, like then that's not being upfront and honest. Mm -hmm. But I do think sometimes if you communicate kind of a mess of thinking or a work in progress, you, you make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. But but that's that's sort of been been my approach is or a team. Like once we we have resolution on something, we've made a decision, uh, we we share that as quickly and as openly as possible. Who does see the mess in your professional life? Like because there is mess, obviously, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, I think as a leadership team, we certainly to me, that's like we're in the kitchen and, 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 and we're talking about that stuff or in peer groups. But but I think as soon as as soon as you're ready to serve the food or as soon as it's it needs to be served, you, you, you might as well take the veil off that. Wow, that, that was a tortured metaphor, but I get it. Yeah, that was that was a bad <laughs> metaphor. I, I lost it in the middle and I kept going. Might as well, you might as well take the tray off the plate as, <laughs> as soon as it's servable, I guess, is the. Is the thing? Yeah, I, I've always said that. It, you don't want to communicate on a broad scale, like kind of a brainstorm, or you know, hey, we might be contemplating laying people off right. or doing this. I, I think when you have a plan, and if you say, hey, if if X amount of uh, reduction happens to our business, then this will be on the table. That's very different than sort of throwing it out there casually. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, a, a therapist that I, I interviewed recently said almost exactly the same thing, which is that there's a difference between sharing your feeling state and being a little vulnerable and shoving the mess in your team's face, which is totally scary and, and inappropriate. You know, it's a little bit like parenting, right? You, you, I always say, mommy cries, mommy gets upset, that's okay. But I don't tell them why I'm crying, because it could be something that's not right for their little nine-year-old ears. Not that our not that our employees are children, or, but but you or, know, or, or or you want time, you know, you want time to to think about it. That's right. right. You want time to process it, and I, I I do think there are moments where you know raw vulnerability is is important, but then I think that right there are others where um we, you, you need some you need some control and and some thought. I I, I shared a story where I, I did share with our team at one point that sort of. I had hit in one of my update videos, like it was just one of those days I had not slept. I had been going for 14 hours and I just sort of like crawled into bed, like kind of on the verge of tears. I just, I just was done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I shared that with some people saying, look, we all have our moments. And someone on the team also had a similar thing on my leadership team and said, I just need a day or two off. I, I you know, I, and came back kind of totally, totally refreshed. And, when I did that, someone shared with me actually the, the sort of cascading effect of that 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 had on their team where they shared with their team something similar. And someone on their team said, look, I just always thought that you had all this stuff together and were sort of a knight in shining armor. And like, I just feel so much better <laughs> knowing that you're, you know, not perfect. And, like she projected a very stable yep. uh, outward. So it, that kind of stuff does have a, uh, a, ca a cascading um, effect. I think that's right, you know, and I and I think that we as humans, again, our spidey sense, we can read people when they are totally out of touch with reality and not acting normal. It would be weird right now if our boss was totally chipper and, uh, you know, Pollyanna-ish and, you know, we're investing $10 million in a new campus and everyone would be like, huh? You know, um, because we're human and we pick up on emotion. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think Andrew Cuomo has been, been really good at this mm -hmm. in terms of he's very vulnerable. He's had the moment. He's clear about that. But then when he's on stage, he, he, he has a commanding presence. He's got the PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which you want from your leadership. Right. It's he, he, he's emotional. He's great. But, but when he's giving you the information and, and, you know, he, he actually, I wrote about this in a Friday Forward. He, he, in one of his early speeches, he he gave three characterizations of the main causes of fear, which I thought was kind of lost in his speech, but was really great. Mm. And it was you're not receiving like the information that you need. Um, you don't trust the information that you receive, or the information that you receive is really frightening. Mm. And it, I think there's been more cases of the first two mm -hmm. than than the last one. Mm -hmm. And, and I think also coming back to general data about employee engagement, we know that employees want to feel 
clear about their role in achieving whatever goal the company sets out, right? They, they need yeah. to feel that buy-in and that sense of purpose and vision and path and milestones. And I think the pandemic is no different. Crisis is no different. Here's why you're important. Here's why we need you. Here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. Okay, let's try to do this together, even though we're all scared, you know? Yeah. And and to that point, I think there's so much more than we can control than we believe. I Ugh. think we th th oh, there's sort of a, really? a stimulus <laughs> and then an effect of you know, this thing happened, but then am I throwing it all out so I don't control it or I control it? We we actually had a moment in our company at, at, at this and we've been very stressing to people, hey, look, let's 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 focus on what we can control. There's not a lot and a lot we can control. And we had some panic partners, you know, calling up kind of our team and saying, can you get on the phone? And people were responding via email or, you know, kind of with incomplete information. And and we were getting some some feedback about that. Mm -hmm. We went to the team and we said, this is one of the things that we control. Mm. Like <laughs> I, we, we've talked about all this stuff we don't control, but you guys can pick up the phone, get the right information, kind of calm them down. Like, and, but this is the actually where you can create the problem. And, and we had that discussion and it totally changed, you know, in the next two weeks. And then we went back to say, look, we, we really, there's a lot that you can control in this, but we've been very clear to point out to people, you know, the specific things they can do, where they can add value, the groups they can join, the brainstorming, the ideas, because to sit there just kind of downstream of the waterfall and feel like you have to just take everything that's coming at you is is not a very good position to be in. How is this different for a services business? As you were saying that, I was thinking, because you're in client services ultimately. It's, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I am too. What's the role of communication right now for people who are in client services who who also have to manage the emotions and anxieties of our clients in a way yeah i i think it's a much heavier burden because it, it is all it is all people mm -hmm. right it's 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 people worried about their job talking to other people about their job mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know as they're doing it it's it's clients and partners that are are, are really upset and nervous and I, you know, it's when th what's rare about this crisis is that everyone's on the same playing field, right? Everyone understands like it is sort of universally impacted people. So a lot of times you have a situation that's going on in one company and that company is talking to another company. But you can almost be sure in this case that when you're communicating with someone else, they're going through very similar things. Mm -hmm. And and uh, yeah, you need to get yourself in a, in a right mindset to do that. Or you can you can actually make what you're doing can make the problem worse. It actually becomes about the stuff you control, not the stuff you don't control. I think that's right. And I think also, you know, it's been it's interesting now that you say that there's there's been a temptation for me um, to, you know, we're all trying to glean information from each other about what's going yeah. on. What are you hearing? Who's losing funding? Who's not? <laughs> um, who's laying off? Who's not? And I've been trying to be mindful of boundaries with clients and then also colleagues in my field because, you know, we have that, that we have that need to try to gain control by getting understanding. But, you know, you have to keep it professional, too. Yeah. And if you're in a services business, the one thing um, I think a lot of people struggle with, they're sort of millennials and maybe Gen uh Gen Z uh, employees is, is 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 the value of picking up the phone, mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know the email. You lose tone. Yeah. You lose a lot of stuff. You say, look, even if you don't have the answer, pick up the phone and have a conversation with the people. It will it will reduce the it will reduce the tension. You can just tell them that you hear them. You can listen to their complaint. They want to feel heard. Um, I, I I've seen phone calls really be helpful during this a hundred or video calls a hundred percent i mean I, I hate talking on the phone but i but i also think just recircling back to the check-in that if if you are a manager and you're wanting to check in with a team member don't email them and ask if they're doing okay <laughs> <laughs> they'll think they're getting fired like you know make it a little bit more personal and and one-on-one -on -one. pick up the phone Right. One thing I've leaned into during this, which I wanted to do more before, I think this has accelerated a lot of things that people want to do more of, but is asynchronous video. So so I had a, oh. an, a person on my management team, like we, we, we were debating something and, and sent me an email and it was very complicated. And I realized it was going to take me 45 minutes to probably answer all the points. And we were we were starting to debate a little bit. I actually just like opened my thing, turned on the camera 
and recorded a response in five minutes. I said, here's, I just want to know, here's why I'm thinking about this. And so they can actually see the emotion behind it and the decision. And they got that video and we like made a decision and resolved it. And it actually was like 80% less time than if I had kind of tried it. Cause you, cause you can, you can send a video that's sort of rough, but you don't send an email no. <laughs> that's rough. You spend the time to clean it up and I, not have typos. Yeah. Also, I, you know, why I love that too, is that the person got the benefit of the nuance of the emotion, but didn't have to react on the spot. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm being super anxious and also kind of introverted. Like I'm really bad at reacting on the spot to tough things. Right. So I, I'm stealing that. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I, I've been doing a lot more asynchronous video. I use it separately also because we have kind of a no update meeting philosophy. Mm. One of the things with everyone being remote, I don't believe in getting a whole bunch of people together on a call, a meeting and just talking to them for mm -hmm. 30 minutes. Like you can record the video and let them watch it <laughs> when, <laughs> when they want to watch it. They don't all have to assemble to basically watch. Uh, uh, you give a dialogue. I think meetings are, are, are a monologue. Meetings are really for for, for dialogue. So many of us, myself included, yeah, in the midst of feeling all these existential anxieties about life and death and the future, are feeling grief, sadness, anger, because we were on the cusp of some big change and growth and pivot that just got killed by the pandemic, whether it was a promotion or going back to graduate school or selling your company yeah. or whatever. And... I wanted to talk to you because you're you're so good at capacity building um, about how someone who is still itching for growth and change in their life can execute or think about a pivot right now, even when things are scary and your father-in-law might tell you not to because you could lose all your money and go out of business. Yeah. What's a good way to think about making consequential decisions right now? Yeah. And, and then, look, there's a pivot because you wanted to, and there's a pivot because you have to. Well, <laughs> and I think there's people you. in different buckets. Thank right? you very much. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a, an absolutely essential thing. Um, but, 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 but just to the first one of the positive pivot, like 2020 was, was going to be a reset year for a lot of us. The economy was yeah. good. We were sort of looking forward to new things and then it, literally got crumpled. Yeah, I, I there's two things. I, I, I think for a lot of people, it's really important. This is a great time to really clarify your values and your sort of values rubric of, you know, what is most important to you, because that that allows you to look at those decisions through a short term and a long term lens where, you know, is it, is it, is it, are you doing it because it's the right thing to do today or because this is the thing that puts you in the direction that you wanted to go anyway, or that you've been talking about, or, or is towards that thing that you can no longer do that you were wanting to do in February. I do think there's some aspect of just accelerating the morning period too. Mm. The faster you come to acceptance that we're not coming back to February 1st, 2020, maybe anytime soon mm. or, or, or ever, the, the, the more you can put yourself in that, okay, so so what are my choices? That's not one of them anymore. Mm. So so given given where I am now, uh, w what are my choices? And it's not an easy thing to do, but but like I almost think of the inverse situation. So I know someone who sold a uh, business, I think on like February 15th, in, like a massive business in oh, the sort of gosh. in in person wax. Uh, and tanning, you know, something that would have been down 80%, you know, two weeks later, and the <laughs> transaction closed. I promise you, they're not wallowing in, you know, oh, I'm so lucky. Like, I'm so lucky. Like, like they're kind of like, it is what it is. <laughs> I know it's the other way, but they're sort of like, it is what it is. I, I can't, I can't control that. So I, the, huh. the faster I think that people can get through their morning period uh, and, and, and say, all right, what, what do I do now? And, and the best choice for what you do now, I think meets that dual test of it aligns to your values. It's the, it's the right thing to do in the short term, but you would have wanted to do it in the long term, right? It, it's, mm -hmm. it's something that really, you know, pushes you in the direction that you want to go. And again, what, what do I learn from it? There, you mentioned selling your business, right? There are a lot of people I know who, 
you know, thought about selling their business, but everyone, when they're having a good year, they wait for the next good year. <laughs> and I'm, and, and there's a ton of regret. Well, I'm, I'm sure actually when things recover, they will probably think very differently about how they want to diversify or take risk off the table. Like this will be the formative mm. <laughs> event for them that maybe for the next 20 years uh, affects how they think about risk mitigation. So, so what's the first question you ask when you're ready to move on from the wallowing and think about what's next? Like, what do I want to do and what can I do? Mm. I, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when I've seen these companies pivot, the ones that have done it really well have done it within their value set, right? It's it's a logical extension to their business. It supports their brand. It's part of their mission. And then this is something we have the capacity to to do. So, you know, let, let's do it. There seem to be very similar anatomies of a lot of the, a lot of the pivots, which is like, get over it. <laughs> I don't mean that like, I mean, it, I know it's not that easy, but uh, I wrote an article about an event planner who uh, last week who, you know, when this hit, she just thought her job was done. And then she planned one of the largest virtual quarantine conferences and then and, and in a month and taught herself all this new stuff and saved her job and, and grew the business. I, but, but Dear I think she God. just had... <laughs> She had a very brief morning period, and and I think probably her anxiety drove her to, to think mm -hmm. about you know a solution oriented mindset. What about someone who had a is forced to pivot when they weren't looking to? Yeah, what's interesting is that people are are doing. Um, it's just accelerating some of the stuff that I think that was going to happen. Anyway, there's people that are forced to do stuff that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a that's a decision. You know, do you want this? Go, again, goes to your values hierarchy. So, so uh, I'll give you an example. Restaurants, I think, are a fascinating case study in this. You have some that are doing delivery, doing totally different stuff, and they're saying, "Look, my job is to keep as many of my people employed as possible and busy as possible. So, no pride." And we're going to do what we need to do. And if it gets us 50% of our revenue, that's 50% more people I can keep working until we can get back to, you know, something that we were doing before. Yeah. And then you have other ones who say, look, we're just not going to, this isn't us. We're not going to do any of this. We're going to stay close mm -hmm. until we can do that. That might be an never, um, but, but that person believes so deeply that they would rather do what they were. It's almost like art. They would rather do what they were doing or not do it at all. I'm not sure it either is a right or a wrong answer. I, I think it's a very personal decision as to what what's most important to you. And, and also, I guess, if you have the resources to make that decision. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing. New currencies come and go. Decades of savings lost in days. All showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan... TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. So you've been talking to a lot of leaders. <laughs> what what do the leaders... Like group, group counseling. Well, I mean, I'd love to be a fly. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. What, what do the leaders who have a growth mindset here have in common? So, so what's really interesting is uh, a friend of mine, Todd Herman, who's a top performance guru, mm -hmm. um, and I wrote an article on this. He's interviewed 180 CEOs, and what he's been doing is record the conversation and then do tag, word, and sediment analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the initial one that he did uh, where he talked to 30 CEOs, uh, and he, he broke them into three groups. So it was the fear focus, the unfocused, and the strategy focus mm -hmm. and just some interesting things i'll give you the opposite spectrum like the fear focus group was consuming five times more media than the strategy group they used the words like government and trump 11 times more than the strategy uh group and they use the words covid or coronavirus seven times more than than, than the strategy group the strategy group w w was was actually nine times more likely to be shifting their product or service four times likely already made changes to their team and um, 
they were using future words 13 times more than the other group. And, and most of them were meditating. Um, so I thought it was a very interesting parallel. So I, I, I've seen things um, that, that parallel to that. People are, what they, what they don't know is how long it's going to go on. Mm-hmm. Um, because this is a very rare thing where it is a medical crisis causing an economic crisis. And none of the business leaders are medical experts. There's a lot of belief that as soon as the medical crisis is better, the economic crisis will will get better. But it's very hard for them to, um, you know, the, the main decision everyone is deciding is whether they end up being too long or too short. <laughs> mm. And, you know, too short is, you know, they were a little too opportunistic and and they just ran out of runway and and too long is they were more conservative than they, than they needed to be. And then there might be some they, criticism. They missed opportunity. Yeah. yeah. They missed opportunity. They laid off people they didn't need to lay off. But no one being in that seat now or eight, eight weeks ago without a crystal ball, it's really easy to write a book in 12 months saying what the right decision was. It's very hard to be in that seat at the time and put yourself there with a crystal ball and say, what am I going to regret more, being long or short? You know, it's interesting, though, because you said that the CEOs that you see making more positive changes or at least we hope they're positive changes, are consuming less media. Yeah. Which makes me think, is does that include financial media? Like, are, are they consulting? Well, so, <laughs> so, so interestingly, I, I, so I don't, I don't know. But one of the other things he said in that is that they're three times more likely to know the Taiwan's response to the coronavirus and, <laughs> and, and sort of why it worked well. So I actually think they're, they're consuming facts, like more data right. and not you know, a lot of our media now is very opinion. News is very opinionated. It's not just news. So I, I think they're 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 gathering the facts, um, and that's true. Most of them are very factual versus kind of repeating stories and narratives that 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 have some uh, agenda to them. I want to come back when you and I spoke. You brought up the Stockdale paradox, and that brought me kind of back in the way back machine. Um, but I want you to tell listeners what it is and why you brought it up in the context of now. Yeah. So so the Stockdale paradox uh, was something that Jim, uh, Jim Collins identified in his kind of landmark book, Good to Great, which I think is probably almost 20 years ago now. And it's, it's, it's sort of made a resurgence through this crisis. I, I, I knew the term and one coach had sent it to me and I heard it somewhere else. And, and then Jim re-recorded a, a, a video. And um, so I wrote, I wrote an article about it, which was just shared more than anything I've written this year. And I realized it just described kind of where every, everyone was. And so Stockdale was an admiral uh, in, in, in the Navy uh, during uh, the Vietnam War, and he was captured and held as a prisoner of war for for seven years. He was tortured and and really had no reason to to believe he'd ma- make it out, and and he did. And when and when Collins was was interviewing him years later, um, he he talked about like how he, he got through that, and he 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 said it was really this 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 combination of never losing hope that he would get out, but but really like just confronting the brutal facts mm. that was that was sort of the key and when collins asked him um you know who didn't survive he said oh that's easy that's the optimist and 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 collins was sort of totally taken back and actually what stockdale found was very tied to victor frankel's uh um what he learned with the holocaust man search of meaning mm. that once once they thought like they were going home that Christmas or they're going home that month and it didn't happen, they kind of like they gave it all lost up. hope yeah. and yeah, and, and, and died of a broken heart. So it, to me, that is the leadership during this, the best leaders are have, they're they're really getting that middle ground. Like here is the really ugly, brutal truth. However, here's here we're gonna get through it. Here's what's gonna look like on the other side. There's gonna be a future because kind of what we were talking about before, if you're on one side of that equation, if you're on the like, just rah, rah, it's all going to be great. And then suddenly like stuff starts falling apart around people, they will totally lose, uh, you will totally lose them. Um, and, and they will not, you know, be very excited to, to, to continue to follow you. And then conversely, um, you know, if, if, if you're just talking about all the bad stuff all the time and there's just despair and there's no potential other side of it, 
then that's not going to work as as well. So I've that really that got me really focused. I, I think we were leaning in that direction, but became really clear that both of those messages are important. There, there's a long term. We're going to be around. It's going to be our defining moment. But yeah, it's not going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to suck. <laughs> Here, here's here's what's going on right now. Um, and 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 that was, you know, that was the Stockdale paradox. But also, some of us could die. Yeah. There, there are health realities. There's economic realities. There's, there's a lot of realities, right? If we, if we forget about some of these health realities, like a lot of people are doing right now, um, sort of suspension of, of, of disbelief, because um, I think people are just, you know, they have some pent up mm-hmm. need to get out there and back to society, which I understand. But, but yeah, they're forgetting some of those stark health realities right now. So, are you an optimist by nature? Uh, I I am a pragmatic optimist. I would say I I, I I'm not a bubbly optimist, but I but I tend to believe that there are pro- there are solutions to to every problem, and I try to focus on solutions. Bob Glazer, I just I just want to thank you and um, for your for your candor and your time, and wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Morris. Great to join you. That's it for this week's show. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or a review and tell your friends. If you have an idea for a show you'd like to send me feedback, you can email anxiousachiever at gmail.com. You can send me a tweet at Mora AM or send me a message on LinkedIn. Special thanks to the team at Harvard Business Review, my incredible producer, Mary Dew, and Saini, Colin Howarth, Adam Buckholtz, Thanks to our advertisers who keep us on the air. And if you like our music, it's from Signal Sounds NYC. From HBR Presents, this is The Anxious Achiever, and I'm Maura Ahrens-Mealy. <laughs>